morning church uh, those of you who do not know that uh, we, are, we are going through a series of messages from uh, lord's prayer and we have reached almost to the end of the lord's prayer this is the ninth part of it uh, in which we are focusing on uh, the second last phrase uh, from the lord's prayer which tells uh, lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil my focus today is mostly going to be on the first half of this phrase not on the second half because the second half was added much later uh, in the in most of the ancient uh, translations of the scripture and the second part was not uh, uh, there but later it was added however we are not going to leave that uh, but i'm going to make few comments on it but but mostly i will be focusing on the first half of the statement uh, the first half of the prayer which is lead us not into temptations I'm totally surprised this morning as I was uh, listening to the songs and singing uh, the songs we sang in the worship service and uh, uh, the, um, the speaking of life and even uh, the service opener, of course, service opener I have chosen uh, to play. But when I have seen the kind of connection uh, that was flowing from the beginning till my sermon was so amazing and it tells us that God is working in the life of GCI in though you know, various people are uh, taking various responsibilities in the worship service it is the same spirit, spirit. he is the same God who is working in each and every one of our lives to bring harmony to lead the church together as one body of Christ Jesus uh, the, the, my sermon, it starts uh, with the prayer, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Do you remember the first song we sang? Shepherd of my soul, I give you all control. Wherever you will lead, I will follow. The songs also were going again with the same theme that God is leading us. Right after the next song, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Okay? And what is the psalm we read? Psalm 23. The Lord shall lead us through still water to, to, to still waters and quiet places. And truly, I'm telling you, I have not discussed with uh, Linda what songs we are going to sing and what psalm you should spear, read. And it's so amazing to see that God's spirit is working in each and every one of our lives. Having said that, so the prayer says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The songs we sang, that God is the God who leads his people. And God leading his people is a main theme in the entire scripture. We know the stories from Genesis till Revelation, how God led people in his ways. We know the story of Noah. We know the story of Abraham. We know the story of Jacob. We know the story of Joseph, Moses, Joshua, David, Solomon, you know, Jesus, the disciples. And it is continuing in the lives of you and me. Amen. He is a God who is interested in, in his people's life and he leads them. And he leads them in a, he leads us in his ways, as the psalmist says in Psalm chapter 5, verse 8. And he leads us in the everlasting way. His paths are not going to come to an end. He is going to lead us through eternal life in everlasting ways. He leads us by his truth and his righteousness. And he leads us to still waters where we find plenty of sustenance for ourselves. And he leads us to green pastures where we can find sustenance and comfort for ourselves. So our God is a God who leads us and he always leads us in his righteousness, in his truth, in his way. And then why Jesus is asking us to pray, lead us not into temptation, as if God is the one who leads us into temptation. And in fact, avoiding and overcoming temptations 
are the major part of Christian spiritual battle. Every time we want to avoid any temptation that comes, in case if we could not avoid, we have to overcome. That is what Christian life, Christian battle is all about. We need to ask this question, does God tempt us? As the literal uh, meaning of the words, you know, on the way in the first reading, we may feel as if God is the one who leads us into temptation. Does God lead us into temptation? Let us see what the scripture says. James chapter 1 verse 13, it says, God does not tempt us to sin. It is written, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. God does not tempt us. Who tempts us? It is the evil one who tempts us, but not God. Saying that God tempts us is like saying God tempting us uh, to sin is acting contrary to his holy nature and against his desire for us to be holy as, his, as the Father in heaven is holy. He is the one who told us, be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. And he told us to be holy and they're leading us into temptation, it is entirely against his nature. So, God does not lead us or may tempt us, or God does not tempt us. That's why James, he continues uh, about the same topic and says in James 1.14, but each one of us is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. It is not that God is tempting us. It is not that God is leading us into temptation. But we are being tempted by our own passions. We are being tempted. Uh, we are being uh, tempted by our own weaknesses. It is not that God who tempts us. In First Corinthians, Apostle Paul writes. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. In the first reading of this scripture itself, we can make out a few points. Number one, temptation is inevitable. It is common or it is natural. It is normal. Okay. I, I was just wondering what is the right word to use even to say when we say temptation is common. If I say common, oh, my temptations are different. Your temptations are different. If I say it is natural, again, there are difficulties with that word. So, however, I do believe uh, the Spirit of the Lord communicates. And from this, I believe you, you are able to uh, relate to what am I trying to say. That, that is, the temptations in human life is inevitable. We will face temptations. Previously, we asked the question, does God tempt us? And this scripture answers. It says, God does not tempt us but he will help us to overcome the temptation. That's what Apostle Paul wrote. It is written, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond your capacity, but with temptation will also make the way to escape. He will not allow you to, to be tempted beyond your capacity, but he will help you to overcome it. So God is faithful. And he will not allow you to be tested beyond your ability. And he will also provide a way to overcome it. That is the God we are worshipping. He is not the God who tempts us. But if you look at this word, um, the, the word temptation, if you go to the root word, it is not actually temptation. The right translation can be test. Testing. And of course, uh, for both of them, the same word was used based on the context. We should be we should be able to discern which word to be used there to translate. This word can be translated both as test and temptation. But in these words, we can we can find this word is talking more like 
a test. There is a difference between test and temptation. Have you ever thought these two are different? Test is there, temptation is there. What is the difference between test and temptation? Think about it. What is the difference between test and temptation? So it is, I feel your explanation caused more confusion to me. <laughs> Both test and temptations are in the same thing. Many a times it will be like that. I can relate what you're saying. You you were saying something, Jessica? Yes, but they are different. Yeah, absolutely. God tests us, but He does not tempt us. Yeah, that's that's a good, a good point. Very simple difference. Test brings the best out of us. Temptation brings the worst out of us. We all have, we all studied in the college, school, college and all. We all had tests. What tests are bringing out? The topics that we have learned, the subject we have learned, the best things that we got from the class. In the paper, we put them, the best things we learned from the class and we will be graded for that. So, test always brings the best out of us. Temptation, on the other hand, it always brings the worst out of us. Okay? If a crore rupees are here, nobody is touching, nobody is around, then that brings probably the greed out of us. Right? So, you may ask, it depends. When a test is there, if you bring the negative, then it is called a temptation. If you bring the positive thing, then you may, you may call it test. But in reality, it is not. You know, the very time, you see, for example, um, uh, look at the life of Abraham. God tested him. He asked him to sacrifice his son. Okay, what can you see in that? The focus, God bringing the test to bring or to show the obedience from him. Right? So it is to show the best of Abraham to the world. That is a test. Okay. And look at Joseph and uh, the wife of his master. He was also in a similar situation. Here, the focus is very clear to bring worst, the lust out of Joseph. Could you see the difference? So test brings the best out of us and temptation brings worst out of us. But our God is a God who leads us through tests and that's also he will not allow us to be tested beyond our capacity but he will always provide us a way through which we will be able to overcome it. Having said that, what does this prayer remind us? And along with this prayer, one more verse we can read, which tells, which supports the point I'm going to bring. That is Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, where Jesus said before his crucifixion, our arrest, he said, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. From here again, it, uh, Jesus was telling us, watch and pray so that you may not be tempted. Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. This prayer, when we say lead us not into temptation, it reminds us of our infirmity or of our weakness to be to fail in our tests. Because our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. So we have to depend on God to lead us not into temptation. Temptation. So this prayer reminds us that we are weak and we have to depend on God. And this prayer reminds us against the examples we see, you know, not to be like the attitude that Peter had. You remember when Peter, when Jesus predicted about Peter's denial, what did he say? 
he says that i am not going to deny you i'll come with you even to uh, he, he says that he will come even to death to follow jesus and in john gospel it is even more presented dramatically where peter was saying you know lord all these people may deny you but i'm not going to deny you that's what Peter said. He's, you can see the self-confidence he had when Jesus told him that Satan wanted to sift him like a wheat. And uh, he said, I don't require your prayer. I am able to overcome it. That's what the attitude of Peter. And you know how it ended up. He denied three times on the roster. Crew, the third time he denied. And he bitterly cried. So the self-confidence really leads us to Failure and the, this prayer reminds us to uh, reminds us about our weakness and challenges us to depend on God and hope in God, who alone is able to help us. As our author of Hebrew says in Hebrew two twenty two eighteen, for uh, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are. Tempted. We all know that Jesus is the one who was tested, tempted in every way possible, just like us, and sometimes in, in many ways beyond us, beyond our capacity to be tempted. But he still remained a sinless, and he is able to help us and bring us out of temptation. He is able to provide us help when we are going through the test. Eh? Temptation. That is a primary thing we can learn from this prayer. We are weak. We need the help of God so that we may be able to overcome the temptation. Having said, let's move. This prayer, Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. It says, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What and The next point we can observe here is, it is not a personal prayer again. I'm so sorry for repeating this point over and over again. Okay, the Lord's prayer is not a personal prayer at all. I, I do, I'm not discouraging you to use the prayer in your personal lives or in your personal prayer life. That's not what I meant to say. The Lord's prayer, if you read it in its words, in its meaning, it is not related to anyone individually, isolated. the better word we can use is iso in isolation. This prayer is not for people in isolation. This prayer is for the community. That is why it doesn't say, lead me not into temptation, but it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So this is not a personal prayer. The Greek word used in the prayer in the place of us is hemas, which is made of two words, he plus mass. You know about the word mass. What is mass? Mass is a book celebration. It is a gathering. Okay, We call it Christmas. Christ is there and mass is there. When people come around, come to Christ together, that becomes Christmas. Just like the Magi's did. And the shepherds have done. So when we are coming together, it becomes a mass and celebration. Same mass, it's about people coming together. So that's the reason I'm telling this prayer is not a personal prayer. But this prayer is a prayer for the church. So what happens then? So this prayer is not about you and me personally asking God to lead, lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. But this prayer as a church together, we are asking God, God lead us not into temptation. As a church, what are the temptations that we are going through? And we are asking God to take us, help us to overcome them, not to fall in those traps. So this prayer is talking about the temptations of the church. So we need to understand what are the temptations of the church. So the first temptation of the church is this, and it is very common from 2020, uh, it has become so very powerful. Big temptation and lots of people started following it. That is, spirituality is personal. In the postmodern world, we have made the religion, the spirituality to be a personal affair. You keep your spirituality to yourself. Don't share your spirituality to me. 
That is the reason nowadays the church is not able to go and evangelize. We, are, we want to keep it to ourselves. Of course, we, have, we may have some fears. I can relate to that. But if we keep our spirituality to ourselves, that is the first trap we are facing because the Christian spirituality is not a personal spirituality for somebody alone. It is a community spirituality. So this temptation made uh, spirituality personal and it made the spiritual relationship that we have with God as psychological. Have you ever failed this? Have you ever thought? The, the, what happens is the moment you are not taking Christ, the moment you are not stretching your spirituality to the next person, it becomes psychological. I'm not saying you don't have any relationship with Jesus. You may be having a relationship with Jesus. If you have relationship with Jesus, you cannot help but having relationship with the people next to you. If you are loving Jesus, you will not be able to help yourself but loving the people next to you. And it, it is so unfortunate that we are not able to bring our spirituality in, in our own homes. Parents have to keep their spirituality to themselves. Children have to keep their spirituality to themselves. And they don't want to talk about God at all at homes. Isn't it happening in our world now? He tells us spirituality. This is a first temptation for the church. We are considering spirituality as personal. In doing that, we are making it more psychological. And we made spirituality limited to prayers. And we made it limited to reading of the scripture and our personal meditations only. The moment you talk about spiritual discipline, these are the only things that come to us primarily. The primary thing that should come to our understanding when we talk about spirituality is the love God extended towards us. And the second thing should be how we are going to love our neighbors. That is the reason in the Bible, the two great commandments, both are talking about loving God and then loving our neighbor. Because entire law is based on it. We, in other words, entire Bible is surrounding it and the entire Bible is centered on it which tells us our spirituality is centered on these two commandments which are talking about loving God and loving neighbor. But unfortunately we made it, we limited it to something called prayer, reading scripture and so called your personal devotion. That is the first temptation for the church. And we are satisfied with virtual church in person not required. Literally, I have heard several people who say that I'm sitting at home, I'm listening to the sermon, I'm listening to some Christian worship. I don't need to come to church. When you sit and just listen a sermon, you will satisfy your intellectual theological thirst, but you will not be able to experience and uh, live that in your life. The gospel becomes an intellectual property if you just limit the church to some kind of message you are listening. The virtual churches, they make it. People who are satisfied with uh, virtual sermons, they make it, they, they are trapped into it. Where the gospel, the message we are listening becomes just an intellectual property. And only a place where we can experience the gospel truly in tangible manner, that is when we come and meet people in person. This is a temptation. That's why author of Hebrew, he encouraged us, you know, meet one another. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 20, 25 says, do not cease to meeting one another. He gives a very strong emphasis to that. And then we have made church as Sunday service. Or, and it's so unfortunate. My brethren, church is not Sunday service or a program, but the congregation that comes together. The moment we talk about church, worship comes to our mind, what the sermon preacher is going to come, that comes to mind. But everything that we do when we come to this place, that is church. And primary thing, there are two things that make church a church. Number one, Christ makes the church church. Without Christ, there is no church. Number two, you, you are making church a church, not what am I speaking from here, not what Linda or Manavara, whoever is singing and leading from here. 
Church is not just the program that we do on Sunday, but church is we coming together to share life, to share uh, the life with God. Of course, I understand there are difficulties, but there are few members who are not able to uh, join the in-person service. I understand. I'm not talking about that, them, but there are lots of people who are taking it for granted. So, Witness, making spirituality personal made the church a program rather than the body of Christ. And what these people do? This makes us they change a church for every two years. They go jump from church to church because they are not able to fit into any community. They are not looking for community. You, you know how difficult it is to say farewells uh, at the end of college? We all experience, right? For a few years we were together, the kind of bond we could we have in between the friends and all, we find it so difficult, either in college or even in the office. Or if you even if you bought a new house, let me tell you, the moment you are shifting your house, though you may be happy about the new house, you will be very much disturbed for leaving your locality. Am I right? Why? It is because the kind of bondings you have. And making spirituality a personal yeah, matter what made it is like you know people are not able to relate to people they come to church they want their focus is only on what kind of sermon is it logical interesting and there are jokes or not and is there good music or not their focus is only on that that is the reason they are not able to relate to the person who is sitting right next to them that's why for every two years they will change the church they don't feel anything sad I understand there are churches where there is no proper teaching, wrong teachings or certain things you are changing. I understand the genuine concerns, but I'm talking about the temptation which all of us we are going through. So church is the ground where we can practice the sermons we have. We hear messages in the church and when you come in person to the people, then only you'll be able to practice it. Otherwise, it becomes only intellectual property. Let's move. Let, let's look at the next temptation of the church. Next temptation, next temptation is activism, in which church is defined and described based on its activities. We said this church is so good, and that church is so good. Okay, why? Because our preferences are met. What are our preferences? There should be my favorite genre of music in the worship. And the sermon, pa pa pastor sermon should be like a dynamic preacher where he includes everyone and all. There may be pastors who will be able to do that. At the same time, there are great pastors who are teaching amazing depths of the scripture. They may not have the same skills. And I have seen churches where pastors are not good. They are not very good with their teaching. But the churches love him. They love them so much because the kind of pastoral care they offer to the members. And some churches where the members have such a great connections, where though their, worship, their music was not great and those things are not going very smoothly, they still want to stick to that church only. And that is where, you know, that is where we are making, we are being tempted very much. We are looking forward for some kind of preferences and some kind of activities, activities, uh, sorry, activities. And <laughs> And this preference-based church charity is based on music and comforts. If there is AC in the church, then I'll come. Otherwise, I will not come. There are people who do that. You might have come across them. Okay? And for these people, it is like more activity is equal, equal to more lively church. If you have more programs, then more lively. Monday to, Monday to Saturday, you should have program and Sunday service, you should have program. If you have seven days program, then only church is active. If you have uh, uh, all sorts of uh, fun activities, then only youth would like to be in the church. Huh? And more lively equal to more spirituality. 
If you just go and jump and play some games, that's, I don't know how that is spirituality. But I'm, I'm not saying you should not enjoy it and you should share life and enjoy the life together as a church. But unfortunately, it has become, it has become the preference of the people these days that more activities should be there, more fun things should be there. Then more activities means church is more lively. If church is more lively, then they say, oh, after coming to this church, we learned a lot, brother. What did you learn? I learn how to do action songs. I learn how to sing. I learn how to play certain games. Did you learn how to relate to the proper people next to you? So this activism uh, is another temptation that we all have. And it has changed the church outlook. And it made a church outlook to be preaching. Because that is the reason churches are based on the preacher nowadays. This outlook is based on music. Churches are based on the music. And the reality is the church outlook should not be the preaching or preacher or the music or the worship style they are having. But a church orientation should be towards people, members. If we miss that, we are being tempted with this. And this will always... You know, you just think about these mega, mega groups where preacher praised, preacher based churches, preacher, preacher comes and preaches, worship leaders and they come and worship, does worship. What does members do? They'll have that show, they'll watch that movie and go in the church theater. Church outlook, this is what happens. We stop functioning as a church. We for we become more like a theater where a few people come and run the show and go. When we make church here, when we tempted with this activism. Um, thank you for the shifting. Uh, next next temptation church is facing is absolutism. We have to be absolutely correct. We are the only true church in the world. Have you heard people saying this? We are the only true church. We are the absolute church. We don't have any wrong teachings. We are all having all perfect and right teaching and right theology. Right, right practices. There are no perfect churches. If you get tempted that we are the perfect church, even I'm talking about GCI, even our own church. If you think we are the perfect church, we are getting tempted. Okay? We are going into this temptation. And this absolutism leads us to pride, judgmental attitude, and stagnation. We judge other, other people. We become proud within ourselves. We become wise in our own foolishness. That's where this absolutism leads and it makes us stagnated. We will not be able to learn. We were, I was taking the course, uh, uh, church, uh, church planting uh, course, and in which one of the points, they said it's disturbing my mind always. That is, it is so difficult to reform an established church. And it is always easy to go and start a new church. The established church, many of them, they are they got tempted to this so-called absolutism, thinking our church already grown, we are perfect, we are we are having right teachings and all, we are having educated church, um, and they are not ready to learn anything more. They are into stagnation. On the other side of it is there are people who got tired of this uh, reformation. You know, regular reformation is a sign of serious and sincere church. If you come to absolutism, we will not be ready for reformation and for the correction. And some say, oh, previously we, you, you told us we are the right church, we are the perfect church, we are the only true church. And then you told us we were wrong. And uh, now again, you are teaching something else. How can I be, be how can I be, how can I uh, be sure that you will not change again? And let me tell you, my brethren, if the pastor comes and tells we were wrong and we have to change again, say hallelujah. Because living things 
know, so growing uh, growing into uh, truth is a never-ending process and living things always grow and growing things always change. If you are not ready to accept its coming change, that means you are not ready to grow. If you are not ready to grow, that means you may not be, you need to question about our living. Growing things always change. If we, I'm telling you, GCA India, even now, previously we, we had our reformation, we changed to something. I'm looking forward that we are going to change much more in the days to come. Reformation is a continuous process. <coughs> That's what Jesus said. He will lead us into the whole truth. Means every day we will be lead, be led into the whole truth. Even Apostle Paul said, when I was a child, I understood like a child. When I am an adult, I understood like an adult. He accepted the change. And if you, you are scared that previously you, you we were told that we were right and then uh, admitted we were wrong. And you, you are scared that we may tell us again that we are wrong. And that means we got stuck into stagnation uh, into the previous things only. We are not ready and we are not opening our minds. If you are ready to change, we are ready to grow. If you're not ready to change, we are not ready to grow. So this is the next uh, other temptation for the churches that we go through. And another temptation, two more temptations, I would like, then I would like to close. Uh, sorry, my sermon is a little long today. Um, uh, next temptation is authoritarianism. Hunger for control and unable to submit. There may be pastors or leaders or the members, they are not able to uh, give, give up control on others. Especially it happens between the leaders. How this person can be above me? He is younger to me and he is coming above me in the hierarchy and I am not able to take it. And we want to be the one who will be deciding anything, everything. You know, a pastor told me who was working in a, a established church and uh, as an associate pastor. And he said, I don't like, he's living in city. We're just talking very genuinely and he has a very good financial support and all. Uh, uh, sometimes we openly talk. Then uh, I told him, you are in a good place. You are getting proper financial support. You will be able to provide for your family better. And he said, no, I like to go to village. I asked him why. Here in this city church, I have, I'm responsible to somebody and I'm, I'm under somebody. They will be guiding me. They will be telling me what I should do, what I should not do. I want to be in a place where I can do everything on my own. You know, this attitude, this thirst for control, this uh, reject, this attitude that we, we don't like to submit to ourselves is another temptation all churches are facing these days. And churches are being divided. We have seen various examples. Churches are being divided for the sake of authority. And once these crops in the church, and it will make the church into too many parts. And one man focused and no accountability. This is again authoritarianism. That's why if you one man one man focused churches, no, they don't have anybody where they have to be accountable. They are the whole and soul of the church. All the finances come there. All the decisions are made by them. All the spirituality is decided by them. <laughs> and uh, one of the uh, definition of a cult I heard from a apolog uh, apologist is this. How can we find a cult? Then he said, a cult is a cult which has wrong teachings, number one, definitely. And number two, the cult is a cult where one man decides everything. So one, these churches, they don't want to have accountability. This is also temptation. All churches have. In fact, we also have. We, we are not free from that. We also are being tempted with that and we should be careful. And we should ask God not to lead us into temptation. And next thing is one man. Nepotism in the church. Pastor son is the pastor. I, my father built this church, so I own this property. They made church as a property. Isn't it? 
that's what we are seeing all pastor children they don't need they don't need to study well also because their career has been already set their father built a church uh, with three four floor building and having 150 families so their career has been set no it is not so, my brother. Even, uh, even if we start our church, even when we talk about GCA India, Pastor Dan is not the one uh, who thinks powers will go to his family, not province family, or any one of our family. Whoever works for the church, that's where it goes. We, we, and because of this, a lot of churches, they are not building second level leadership. That scale. If other people are developed in leadership, they will take away the power and the career from their children. And you can see in Hyderabad, so, so many big organizations were divided just because of this. One, uh, so we have to move from one man uh, soul to a team approach and which we are trying now. And that's why Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21 always reminds us, submit to one another, which is, otherwise we will get into the temptation of this authoritarianism. And in Matthew, Jesus said, Matthew 20 verse 26 to 28, whoever wants to be great among you should become the servant. Who He who is not, to be, not ready to be a servant is not ready to be the leader. So this authoritarianism is another temptation we are facing. We should be careful with that. And the last temptation I would like to present before you is divisions. First Corinthians chapter 1 verse 12 says, Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. I am, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? This is in the first church, first century church itself. It's not even 100 years after Jesus death. Right? Just, just 20 years or something. 20 to 30 years after Jesus' resurrection. Already divisions have come. These people are creating groups based on leaders. They are creating groups. And even most of the churches are being divided also like this. Only they have the struggle for authority. And some members support somebody. And some members support the other person. And groups are made and are divided. And it is so unfortunate to see even in Indian church that we are divided by caste. We are divided by people, leader. We are divided by caste. We are divided by music. No. We are divided by the Bible translation. The church, conservative churches in America, they won't have many, I mean, many conservative churches, not all. The conservative churches in America, they won't accept others who use any Bible other than KJV. He got stuck with some the Bible translation. And rich and poor, based on this, we are divided. We are divided for control. We are divided for prominence. Aren't these temptations that we are having in the church? The moment we label somebody, he is an educated, he is not an educated, we are creating the division. The moment we say these are rich people, these are poor people, the moment you are counting them and making them groups, that itself is making divisions. The moment this thought comes into our mind, we have already made the divides in our minds and soon or later those things will come forward and they will spoil the community. Aren't these the temptations the church is going through? Yes. And we need to pray to God not to lead us into temptation. And in these situations, the most unfortunate thing is the pastor taking sides. No. I remember, uh, you know, uh, somebody told me in a city church, okay, they have around 2,000 families in the church and they divide the church into various segments and all the rich people, areas and people, members, families will be visited by the senior pastor and the poor people's families will be visited by the associate pastors. They already made those divisions. This is literal and it is happening. And they fight for that. 
We are praying, lead us not into temptation and made it through personal. But they see is the temptations that as a church we are going together. Can you see the massiveness of it? Massive, the kind of uh, how big these temptations are. So, are we peacemakers or peacebreakers? The church is at the verge and at temptation. Who are you going to be? Church is called to be the body of Christ and we are called to stir up the love among one another as our Father in heaven loves all irrespective of what they are. He loved us in irrespective of rich, poor, uh, educated, uneducated, white, black, woman, man, Jew, Gentile, nothing. There is no Jew, Gentile, no slave and uh, master. The Christ has broken the divide and he loved everyone. And we are called to love. Stir up love. Look at the word. You know, stirring up love. Imagine. That is a very strong and powerful statement. Stirring up love for one another. And we are called to be that, not to be the peace breakers and make divisions. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24 says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. And we are called to be advocates, not accusers. We are the advocates for our brethren, not the accusers of our brethren. Lots of times we see members will be accusing the other members and speaking all sorts of nonsense and ultimately that's leading towards divide and healthy churches. Uh, when you talk about any other member, think about it. Are you going to be the accuser or the advocate for your brother? Jesus is someone who is advocating for us before the Heavenly Father. We have an advocate in Heavenly Father, Heavenly Realms, John says. Jesus is speaking for us and the devil is the one who was always accusing. Now church, we are going through this temptation. What are we going to be? We are called to be the comforters, not problem makers, just like the Holy Spirit who is the comforter. Second Corinthians chapter one verse four says, "We comfort. We com uh, Sorry, who comforts us in all of our tribulation? That is God, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Oh, God is comforting us so that we may offer the same comfort to others. Are our words comforting people or condemning people? We need to introspect ourselves." And we are called to be one as God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. John in John, Jesus was praying, John 17, 22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one as we are one. There is a oneness in God. And God wants, Jesus prays that we all may be one. That is the desire of God. How can we be one? When we overcome these temptations, temptations of personal spirituality or limiting spirituality to personal uh, uh, matter and then activism, absolutism, authoritarianism and these divisions. These are the things that are dividing us and destroying the church. These are the temptations as a church we are going through. And as I said, I'll make very few comments on the second part of this prayer that is deliver us from evil. Uh, actually, this Greek sentence is not a perfect sentence in which this evil can be uh, considered as evil one and it can be considered only as evil. Okay, so uh, the definition, if you go for the root word for evil, is raw in Hebrew, and which will be defined as goodness spoiled. And in other words, willful ignorance. Evil is willful ignorance. Now, brethren, the Holy Spirit and God is reminding us about the temptations that we are going through. What are you going to be? Now you are informed. You are going to be careful in this temptation or you are going to be willfully ignorant. That's what, that's what it is talking about. 
willfully are we going to be ignore all these matters that are happening in the church sometimes maybe contributed by us or we are going to just ignore and which is evil in other forms and uh, author of Hebrews, he says in chapter 4, verse 7, Today, after such long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. If God is speaking to you about the temptations, as a church we go through, please do not harden your hearts. Having said that, we all know all these temptations are at our next step. You know? We don't have the ability to overcome by ourselves. We need God and we need his help, without which we will not be able to overcome this temptation, not alone, not even as a church. That's why we ought to pray to God, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And we need to do all that possible that helps us to overcome the temptation. And one among them that helps us to be united, to be one, to be together, so that we may be able to overcome all these temptations, is the communion that is right in front of us. I asked actually to get only one bread. Uh, pre usually we break the bread and bring. I asked not to bring so that I can symbolically show that symbolically show that we can we are take, partaking in one bread. Uh, however, due to various reasons, we could not have one bread uh, in peace, but pieces of bread is available, which are brought from the same bread. Okay. Uh, so communion is something that is that brings us together. We all are partaking in one bread and one cup. Beloved in the Lord, our Savior Christ, on the night before he suffered, instituted the sacrament of his body and blood as a sign and pledge of his love for the continual remembrance of the sacrifice of his death and for spiritual sharing in his risen life. For in these holy mysteries, we are made one with Christ. For in these holy mysteries, we are made one with Christ and Christ with us. We are made one body in him and members um, sorry, members uh, and members of one another. So in this we are made one body in him and members of one another. Yet we must keep in mind sanctity of the holy sacrament if we are to appropriately participate in the celebration of these holy mysteries and be fed by the spiritual food. So, I request you to think about how St. Paul uh, urges everyone to make preparations before consuming the bread and consuming the cup. Let us introspect ourselves. Are we going through any of these temptations? This bread makes us one with God, one with God and it makes us one body with Him and it makes us members of one another. As we are partaking in this bread, we are sharing one life together, sharing the life of one another. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26 to 27, Apostle Paul says, for I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For as, for as often as you eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. We are partaking in one bread, which is symbolizing Christ, and one cup, the blood symbolizing Christ. Christ. So, let us examine our lives and conduct our lives and conduct by the rule of our Lord's commandments. Love your God with all your soul and love 
your neighbor as I have loved you. That we may perceive where we have offended in what we have done or left undone. Let us examine about what we have done. Whether in thought or in deed, let us acknowledge our sins before Almighty God with full purpose of bringing change in life, being ready to forgive those who have offended you, and then being reconciled with one another. Come to the banquet of the most heavenly food. Let us pray. Screen, you can pray along with me. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against Thee in thought, word, and deed, but by what we have done and by what we have left done, left undone in our personal lives and in the lives in the church as the members of the body of Christ. We have not loved Thee with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of thy son Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in thy will and walk in thy ways to the glory of thy name. Amen. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I declare your sins are forgiven in person as and even as a church. I welcome you to participate in the next. Jesus Christ, which has been shed for you and me and for the body of Christ as you and me as members of the body of Christ. We all stand and partake in the communion and as we partake, let us pray the Lord's Prayer and we partake in this communion. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, glory, forever and ever. Amen.